Welcome to Lecture 27b, entitled Divergence Theorem, and here we apply the principle of superposition. Uh, the material that's being covered here comes from Reading Assignment 5, Section 2.4, Sections 3.2, this is Cylindrical Geometry, and Section 3.5, and additional problems in Section 5. Uh, some supplementary material that you might want to refer to is also reading assignment 0 section 5.2 and archived lecture 1c. Now, the objectives are to apply superposition in the divergence theorem for an electrostatics problem and the main concepts or visualization skills basically obtained through this uh, particular lecture are as to illustrate the procedure for determining the total field using superposition for an irrotational example. As usual, the second slide is more or less a summary of the slides to follow, so we'll just move on. All right, so now let's discuss what we mean by the various symmetries that we'll be dealing with when we apply the divergence theorem. We have planar symmetry, spherical symmetry, and cylindrical symmetry, and associate with each one of these particular objects, we have a plane of symmetry, a point of symmetry, and an axis of symmetry. And this can be seen from the diagram shown below. So for instance, this cylinder is displaced a certain distance away from the, uh, from the origin. So in this case, the axis of symmetry of this cylinder is basically not aligned with the z-axis. And of course, we can move this back and forth in this simulation by just basically adjusting the value of p, this slider in the interactive program. Similarly, when we're dealing with an infinite slab or sheet, which is this dark blue that you see here, this can be moved back and forth uh, just by basically playing with the slider for um, variable slider r. And with this slab, if we take a cross section, this space can uh, put a slice through there, and this plane that you see in light blue is the symmetry plane. In other words, it sort of bisects the plane. And so the distance between the origin and the symmetry plane, right, is this blue arrow. Uh, and then the distance between the symmetry plane and the observation point is this blue arrow that you see your vector here. As far as the distance between the symmetry axis for a cylinder to the observation point, it's this red line here. And the last item we'll deal with is a sphere. So in this case, it's a point of symmetry. And with a point of symmetry, this basically the yellow object, we can move this sphere back and forth by just adjusting slider Q here. And so we have the distance from the orange origin to the symmetry point and the distance between the symmetry point and the observation point. Now, when we treat each one of these problems as individual objects, we've always taken a reference point to be one in which essentially all measurements are done with respect to the axis of symmetry when dealing with symmetrical symmetry, with cylindrical symmetry. We're always dealing with a measurement reference point as being the plane of symmetry uh, for our infinite plane, and we're taking the center of the sphere as basically being our reference point whenever we're doing calculations involving spheres. But when we're dealing with objects now that are placed at different locations, we need to compute for each one of these that the field pattern for given symmetry. Similarly, for the cylinder, we would compute this one, again, with, with respect to its local axis of symmetry. And similarly, we would have to basically do the same thing for plane of symmetry. And then using the principle of superposition, everything would be done in Cartesian coordinates, and the solutions would be added up. Nevertheless, if you want to look at this object here, uh, you can by just clicking on this link. All right, just a quick review of the symmetry and the computational steps. I mean, we discussed this already in the last lecture, so I'm just repeating myself here. So if you have a field F1 due to a row 1, and you have a field F2 due to row 2, and if you sum the two fields due to the contribution of row 1 and row 2, essentially, basically, it can be done. All right, so this is just basically uh, stating the, the uh, principle of superposition. All right, so how we're going to calculate the total field, where now basically we could have charges, distributions of different geometries at different locations, and so we need to know how we're going to do a calculation. So these are more or less the four steps. We compute the field for each object, assuming objects are all centered at the origin for spheres, 
aligned with the axis symmetry for cylinders or lie along the plane of symmetry, which is aligned with one of the principal planes. It's, of course, we're dealing with infinite planes. So if it's parallel to the xy plane, then basically the plane of symmetry would be the uh, xy plane, uh, and you'd be bisecting the object. The next step would be to convert each field into Cartesian coordinates. So you sub solve each one of these problems independently, and then you transform them into Cartesian coordinates. The next thing to do is to transform the fields to represent the physical location of the original objects with respect to a reference point, usually taken to be the origin, but not necessarily the case, and compute the field for each object at the observation point. Once you've done that, then you basically have a common reference point, so you can sum the fields to obtain the total field F, which will be in Cartesian coordinates. All right, and so just two specific notes here. Recall that the principal supervision states that the total field at a point is a sum of all the individual fields at that point, I focusing on the field produced by each geometry individually and then adding up all the field contributions. Second note is that not all problems will require converting the geometry into Cartesian coordinates. Depending on the geometry, you may choose which coordinate system will result in the simplest calculations and appropriate summary, but this comes with practice. All right, so here's the example we're going to work with, uh, you, again, using the divergence theorem. And so there are two pictures here, one here, which is a perspective diagram, and this is an XY trace. That's basically a cross section taken uh, so that you're looking at the XY plane, looking downwards. So you'll see here we have an infinitely long cylinder intersecting with another infinitely long cylinder. And the red cylinder has a uniform charge density of minus rho naught, and the blue has a uniform charge density of rho naught. And the observation point is located on the x-axis at this point. And so what we're wanting to do is to compute the field at this location due to these two objects. But typically, I wouldn't draw this picture. I would essentially give it to you in the form of a table, such as shown here. So you'd be given a charge density distribution, rho of 1, given as follows. So if you'll notice here, each one of these describes a region. So this basically would say that it's outside uh, both cylinders. So for instance, if I say 0 for x squared plus y minus 0 0.5 cent greater 1 and, so logic and, and x plus y plus 0.5 greater than 0, that would represent basically everything that's outside both cylinders, out in this region. I also have that uh, another condition, it would be zero inside both cylinders. So this purpley area that you see, this is the intersection set. I would say that that's zero on the inside. So you would have a charge density in a sort of a, a, sort of a, a three-quarter moon, and you have a different charge density in this three-quarter moon, and zero in the middle. That's more or less how the problem would be stated. I've just basically drawn a picture which represents exactly the same thing. And so this represents the conditions where you're inside both cylinders. All right, so then we have basically another condition, rho naught. So the rho naught would be the blue cylinder excluding the overlap region. It would be just in this section. And then the red cylinder excluding the overlap region, which is described by this region, which is just this region here, which is in this sort of uh, three-quarter moon section. And so given this information, not the picture, the picture you have to draw for yourself, compute the total field at the observation point here. Okay, so this basically describes this, but you could look at this as being one cylinder and a second cylinder and treat each cylinder as an individual problem. But the first thing you would do is take this cylinder move it back so that its axis of symmetry is aligned with the z-axis, and similarly you do the same thing with the, the blue cylinder. And then basically you're ready to solve the problem. And this is just the trace basically to show you the region where there's a charge density, this region there's no charge density, this region there's opposite charge density, and the exterior region there's also no charge density. So just again a summary, pictorial description of the geometry is given to you on your left. Summing the charge distribution for the blue and red regions, you obtain a value of zero in the region where the two cylinders intersect. And you treat the blue and red cylinders as independent objects. So you end up with two subproblems. So you have to compute the field for two se separate cylinders. All right, so this is just a summary of things that we already know, but I like to sort of remind people these are the things we're going to have to do. These are the general principles when applying the divergence theorem to solve irritational problems with a high degree of symmetry. 
And so this is the left-hand side of the divergence theorem. This is the right-hand side. But because of the specific physical problem we're dealing with, divergence of f is equal to rho, and rho is a given. And so this part of the problem is a given. All right, so again, just a reminder, the differential area vector convention, the differential area vector NSDS points outwards from the Gaussian surface in closing the volume. We're dealing with cylinders here in both cases. So how many discrete surfaces basically create a closed surface? Uh, three, because you have a bottom and a top surface to the cylinder and the, ex and the exterior cylindrical surface. Second, we're going to choose the Gaussian surface so that on any segment of the closed surface, one of the following three conditions is satisfied. Either f is perpendicular to the differential surface area vector on that surface, or f is equal zero on that surface, or f is parallel to NSDS, and f dot NS is uniform along the Gaussian surface. So we want to exploit any one of these three, in which case the problem is solvable. Third, the right-hand side of the divergence theorem needs to be broken up into piecewise continuous regions if rho is not continuous. In our case, basically, you have rho existing within the circular object, and then it's not equal to zero outside, which means that in each cylinder, you have to describe it in terms of two regions, inside and outside the cylinder. Fourth, for any given geometry, the left-hand side of the divergence theorem needs to compute it only once and can be committed to memory, but you should state what you're doing without going into details. And fifth, in the event that two or more objects have a similar symmetry, example, nested cylinders or spheres, share the same axis symmetry or symmetry point, then there's the option to solve the problem as a single problem without resorting to superposition. You can use superposition, but it's just basically another level of, uh, another layer of work. Okay, so now we basically work through our procedure for computing the total field. So we're going to solve the field for the cylinders with respect to a common axis of symmetry. So we're doing that for both the blue cylinder and the red cylinder. And so we're applying the divergence theorem. All right, since we've already solved the case of cylindrical symmetry, I'm not going to redo it. It's left to you as an exercise due to the computations along the line spelled out in section 3.2 of reading assignment 4, or to review lecture 26 for the calculation procedure. The final results are here. This is basically in uh, cylindrical coordinates for r greater than or equal to 1. It's basically going to be pro uh, inversely proportional to the radius. And for r less than 1, it's proportional to the radius. So this is for the blue cylinder. And this is, would be for the red cylinder. Don't forget, in one case, the charge energy was positive. In the other case, it was negative. So this is where both cylinders basically have an axis symmetry that's aligned with the z-axis. And now we have to basically move those two cylinders to their rightful place so that we actually uh, uh, capture the correct uh, the, the problem that we stayed, started with in the first place. Okay, so here I've just repeated what it looks like in cylindrical coordinates. The next step basically is to convert into Cartesian coordinates. So we know that the r hat vector basically is a unit vector, has this form, and we know that r is basically the square root of x squared plus y squared. So you can see it showing up here. In this part, part here, it's proportional to r, and so you can see it's the square root of x squared plus y squared. So this is for the blue case, and for the red case, which only differs by the fa factor of minus for the charge density. We now basically have transferred everything into Cartesian coordinates. And the next step would be to translate this information back to the original coordinate system. All right, so the next step would be to translate the field solution for each subproblem to the original reference frame. And so the third step is the field translated with respect to the reference axis. All right, and so we have four possibilities. That is, we could be outside the blue cylinder, we could be outside the red cylinder, we could be inside the blue cylinder, we could be inside the red cylinder. So we could have four possible combinations that can exist depending on where the observation point is. So this is actually quite general as it's stated right now. So the, what we, we would do, we basically now translate the uh, calculations we've done for Cartesian coordinates for all these four cases back to the reference position. So for the blue, means we have to translate it by 5 units, 0 0.5 units, and so the y basically now gets changed to y minus 0 0.5, wherever y appears. 
So this would be for the blue, if we're outside the cylinder, which is indicated by this expression here. For the red, uh, the translation would be in five units in the opposite direction. So everywhere where there's a y is now replaced by y plus 0 0.5. And you can see here it shows up in four different locations. And again, this is outside uh, the cylinder because of the greater than sign. Inside the cylinder, the expressions were quite different in terms of the field. But again, when we're dealing with the translation, then in the case of the uh, blue cylinder, uh, the y becomes y minus 0 0.5. So it appears here, 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 and here in four different places. And of course, this expression indicates that you're inside the blue cylinder. Uh, for the red case, uh, we would end up having to do a translation of 0.5 units in the opposite direction. And again, it appears in four places, one here, 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 and here. And again, this indicates that you're inside the cylinder. So now these are the individual field values, basically translated with respect to the reference axis. And the next step would end to be to figure out which one of these combinations applies based on the observation point. All right. So let's move on. Uh, the last thing would be the total field that we'll be computing with respect to the observation point. But first thing would be to first compute e each field at the observation point of 400. Zero, zero. All right. So because the observation point is outside both cylinders, that you can basically show right away, uh, th then we would be using the following two expressions. We'd be using the expression from the previous slide for the blue, which involves outside and for the red outside and so now what we would do is take these two expressions and substitute the value for the observation point which would be x equals 4y equals 0 z equals 0 into both of these expressions if we do that then we find for the field due to the blue cylinder we end up with this expression and for the red cylinder we end up with this expression and so the last step is basically to add these two fields together to, to basically obtain the total field measured at the point 400 on the, based on the contribution from the two cylinders. That concludes Lecture 27B. Thank you for listening.